and welcome to the 100th episode of Latitude. And we are looking at a very important subject, a subject that is redefining the contours of terrorism and the threat that it places on various societies. The emergence excessively of lone wolf attackers largely in western cities. But the big question is, is the lone wolf an awkward, mentally deranged individual or is he being inspired often by the ideologies being propounded by hardline Islamic groups like the ISIS. And joining us uh, to look at the phenomena of the lone wolf and the attacks that continue to increase right across the world, particularly the Western world, we have two experts both on terrorism and those who follow events particularly related with the ISIS and its activities. We have Dr. Sriram Cholia, Professor of International Relations at the Jindal School, as well as a regular commentator in the print media on the menace that the ISIS has now begun to become for the rest of the world. Uh, Dr. Cholia, this is a very good point that General Karim makes. And what we have seen that uh, particularly in European cities, uh, in the case of France, in the case of Belgium, and possibly even Germany, that uh, the local police seem to be at sea in terms of how they should have responded to this. There was a certain degree of complacency. Uh, but on the other side, uh, you have a highly vigilant society like the United States, and you have homegrown terrorists who have gone and done things like the Orlando massacre. So uh, what do you propose as steps in bullet points that need to be done, particularly in the Indian context? Well, policing and intelligence for sure uh, have come up short in uh, handling this unorthodox problem. The uh, FBI director, James Comey, made an interesting comment that uh, uh, it's not about uh, you know, finding needles in the haystack, which is anyway the case, but finding the haystacks from which the needles will emerge. So clearly, some degree of profiling and narrowing down uh, upon uh, the usual suspects or uh, you know communities, or uh, I would say even more granular level of com community level uh, understanding of uh, localities. Uh, in a way, we have to go back to the basics. Uh, there's been a lot uh, being said and written about uh, lone wolf terrorism globally, but ultimately they emerge from a lot of local communities. These are mostly uh, young males uh, with the criminal record and people who may suddenly take to religiosity or who are doing unusual online activity. So it is possible through monitoring internet trafficking and surfing as well uh, as, well as uh, you know, day to day living in communities at the level of streets and uh, lanes where we have to get down to be able to stop this menace. But of course, uh, it cannot be completely eliminated. But at least identifying potential uh, threats and being alert to these uh, will uh, possibly reduce them to some extent. At the end of the day, you know, it, it, this is a random threat. As uh, General Sir said, it's also, uh, you know, mostly these are amateurs and they have not, uh, no clear connection to any organized terror group. They're being inspired uh, in the mind. So it's an ideological problem. And we'll have to also find ways to, you know, counter radical, prevent the radicalization through counter uh, uh, moderate uh, ideologies. Uh, Dr. Cholia, uh, they say internet is the, the biggest menace because of free societies and freedom to use internet and for internet to be used, uh, which ISIS has mastered uh, their marketing through internet and to reaching out to all sorts of wayward individuals and sometimes uh, people who would have otherwise been seen to be um, people who are awkward but violent, with violent tendencies, suddenly you give them a purpose in life. You've given them ideology through internet. You know, preachers and, you know, internet preaching is going on. So what is immediately the step that you would suggest as a counter to this internet radicalization? Well, I think we need to have two levels. One is obviously blocking of uh, sites and preventing people from accessing. But, you know, ISIS is like Hydra. They have like multiple Twitter accounts and Facebook accounts that keep popping up in different names and different avatars. So if you shut down some, then there are new ones that are immediately replacing them. So it's like a cat and mouse game they play. But that has to go on. The second level, which is more important, is we need to have actually most governments around the world should invest in um, spreading moderate uh, versions of Islam as well as uh, generally moderate uh, thinking about solving social problems uh, by having 
people who are actively posting and countering their views in different languages and uh, you know also internationally in English, so that there is a kind of um, a counter narrative. Because what happens is many of these assertions that the jihadists and their uh, recruiters make go unchallenged, and that becomes the basis for brainwashing online. And then a lot of these encryptions that are happening now in the name of privacy and protecting consumer uh, safety and so on are, are being misused. You know the San Bernardino killers, for example, of Pakistani origin who went out on a rampage. Um, they used uh, technology that was encrypted and it has, the technology company refused to disclose it even after the event. And the US government had to fight them. So in the name of privacy, some things are happening. I mean, if you have nothing to hide from the agencies, uh, why will you think that they will misuse the data against you? At some point, you have to give in. And the societies, unfortunately, most of the world, societies are willing to trade in some of these so-called civil liberties in order to enable greater monitoring of uh, internet traffic. Interesting. Uh, and as you've seen in the case of America, uh, particularly that uh, people now go through quite happily the routine long checkups at airports and other places because they seem to be quite convinced that that is what is good for them. Dr. Cholia, as General said, that the lone wolves often come from the societies itself uh, through which they put out the attacks. What we have seen is also a very great similarity that bulk of some of the big terror attackers, at least in Europe over the last year or so, have been people who have never been to a mosque in their life, but before they died, they either got in touch with ISIS headquarters or they gave some Islamic war cry and sending further paranoia and fear and creating this mental divide between the Western world and the Islamic world. The second thing is that uh, there seems to be a great deal of helplessness right now amongst police and intelligence agencies that how do you separate uh, the possible attacker from the ones who have suspicious behavior. And often suspicious behavior may be in a person's mind. How do you read what is in a person's mind? And even if you do, you cannot stop or confront a person till he conducts an act which will be a complete uh, shocker to society. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, and from the jihadist point of view, lone wolves are like uh, force multipliers and a kind of people's war. You like you weaponize anybody and everyone who can go and become a so-called uh, uh, you know foot soldier for the cause. So similarly, the response has to be on people's mobilization. I mean, if you look at it, the research on counterterrorism shows that most of the lone wolves do talk about their intentions to their near and dear ones or whoever they are in close contact with. They do declare. Uh, you know, their plans to carry out um, massacres or, or murders um, before doing it. The question is, at what point do these get reported or not? So therefore, you know, the onus lies to a great extent on uh, sensitizing communities and uh, local people to report any such suspicious activity. Uh, vigilance, of course, is the way, you know, is the antidote. And at the same time, you know, families, the onus on families. In Bangladesh, for example, you saw, you know, so-called ISIS terrorists who don't seem to have, you know, directly been trained uh, in Syria, but who went on uh, this uh, killing spree and in Dhaka recently. And in that case, you know, you, you saw that some of these youth actually um, disappeared from their homes, but they were not reported to the nearest police station for a while. And even if they were, there was not a wider message up the intelligence chain saying, listen, in this particular community, in this uh, locality, this young man has gone missing for the last six months. And then nothing is heard about him. And the next you hear is, you know, he's taking hostages and uh, shooting people. So we have to actually trace disappearances and suspicious activities like this, report them, join the ch pieces. And that's the only way we can reduce, if not uh, completely eliminate these kind of attacks. And that's the same point I wanted to ask you also, Dr. Cholia, that we have seen that uh, some of the biggest attacks prior to the Nice attacks was the case where in Norway, Andres Breivik in 2011 killed 77 people. Now, I mean, he really wasn't inspired, as far as I know, by ISIS or Daesh or any of these Islamic groups. But he had a problem with himself or with the society, and he went out and did what he did. And a number of these attackers that I have tried to study, and if you go back into the internet to see, there are almost 100 of them listed. Bulk of them didn't really have an Islamic ideology that was pushing them. But now there seems to be a distinct change. 
more and more there is that happening. That's one part of the question. And a short answer I would like, how should societies cope with it? Indeed, one must not overreact disproportionately to some of these small attacks, like a knife attack, which involves, you know, which looks more like a criminal activity rather than a terrorist one. Uh, but on the other hand, as you said, you know, lone wolves etymologically started with white supremacists and neo-Nazis, not with the Islamists or jihadists. If you go back to the 1990s when this term began to be used and became prevalent, it was for, you know, people who are motivated by uh, racism not religious uh, hatred. So there is that angle. We must not make uh, too much of a distinction between the two and say, you know, if, he, if the attacker is white and if he's driven by racism, then he's not a terrorist. But if the attacker is brown and or Arab or Muslim and he's uh, d driven by ISIS, then he's a terrorist. There is right-wing terrorism. Anders Breivik was also a terrorist. He was motivated by political ideology with the Heil Hitler uh, sign that he used to make everywhere and believed in exterminating uh, so-called uh, you know, non-white people who are uh, threatening the way of life of Europeans. So we must counter right-wing hatred as well, because if you leave one aside and simply focus on the jihadists, then you're missing the you know, forest for the trees. Right. Thank you very much for being with us on this show. We'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, goodbye and thank you.